Mark is going to lead our discussion on the early recognition and treatment of sepsis, focusing in on purpural sepsis. Purple steps. Now, the mo uh, 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 here's a disclosure to begin with, okay? I am certainly no expert on obstetrics, okay? So, and I'll, I'll tell you how much I'm not. When Tom asked me to do this, he said, it's going to be on purple sepsis. I'm like, what? <laughs> purple sepsis? So, I had to go to Wikipedia and look up purple. So, when you see me put up a slide that says something about the different kinds of OB infections, I defer to you all, okay? So it's sort of embarrassing, the same thing when people talk about anesthesia stuff or ICU stuff who are not intensivists or anesthesiologists, all of us usually sit there and go, you know, they just understand so little about it. So I am the first to disclose to you that is not my shtick, okay? Okay, but my shtick really is sepsis because as the co-director in the ICU, probably 25 to 40 percent of people come down with sepsis or we talk about sepsis, it is the vast majority of the things that we, we treat overall. So that is my shtick, but there are a couple slides about OB sepsis and please add anything you'd like to do specific to the infection, okay? Um, I'm starting with a test to begin with. So if you look at your uh, hand out there, and uh, the nurses should do this also because it's not just a, I have, I, I copied 20 of them, so that's just about right, I think. It's a one-page form, and then there's also a multi-page slide handout. Okay, and this is graded by Dr. Beatty, okay, and this will go into your permanent record. Okay? I'm just kidding, okay? So what's going to happen, I'm going to actually have you fill this out without your name on it and turn it in, okay? And I'm going to repeat the same uh, quiz at the end, okay? So here are the questions. Okay, does everyone have a sheet? It's a single page sheet. Uh, there should be 20 of them. I don't think there are 20 people here. Okay. Okay. All right, so one through four, I don't know if you can see that. One through four, these are the questions. These are the um, the different uh, possibilities. I won't read it out loud since you guys can read it out loud. Read it to yourselves. And if you get it wrong, it's no big deal. Actually, I'm sort of hoping you get it wrong. Because then at the end, it's sort of, wow, look how much you've learned. So, yeah. sort of my. Okay, we all set with this one? Yep. Everyone read all of them? This is a one through five. I don't know how I came up with one through five and the other one through four, but I did. Another 10 seconds, and then I'm going to switch them. Okay. Yeah, this is a tough one for the docs. Uh -huh. For the tough one for the docs. Uh, there are some specific nursing ones here, too. But this comes into play, I'll tell you that, in terms of quality of uh, data that we receive in the ICU. This will take all your skills as a good test taker over many years. This one. Okay. You're not doing 50-50. <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, you don't have a 50-50 or lifeline. A lifeline or, you know, it's like a cash cap kind of stuff, you know, call out. Ask the audience. Yeah. Okay. All set, guys? Optimal time for antibiotics. Another five seconds, I'm going to switch them. Peggy, no cheating back there. <laughs> All right. Oh, now this is a good one. All right.
You know what it's supposed to say? I'm sorry. It's supposed to say the antibodies of choice for sepsis are not. Three of the four are, are okay. okay. Okay? One is wrong. Sorry about that, guys. Which is, yeah, except. That's the word I need to change for next time. Okay? This should be exact. This should be an easy one. This is a good test taking one, okay? All right. Another two minutes, okay? Dr. Aaron. Oh, we'll go back for Gene, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the last one. It's specific to Newton Wellesley Hospital. This is when I remember to put not in. <laughs> All set? All right. Why don't we, uh, if we could, why don't you pass those in? Okay? No, you don't have to put your name on it. No, I don't want to know people's names. Oh, really good, Gene. Gene comes from number six. Thank you. That's because you knew I was going to ask a question, didn't you? Right. Maybe we'll have Gene say his answers out loud, and I'll go back. So, this is, this is a theoretic case of one that we never want to see on our fifth floor, okay? Nor come down to our second floor. So a 30-year-old, spontaneous rupture of membranes a long time ago, 24 hours uh, later, prolonged arrested dilatation afterwards, six hours and nine centimeters, has a low-grade temp for two hours. Decision for a C-section. Temp when she goes to the operating room is 100.4. She's given the usual Ketzol, okay, beforehand, because things don't seem that bad, but you guys are concerned enough that there's something nasty going on. In fact, she has foul-smelling amniotic fluid consistent with chorioamnionitis. She hits the PACU, and bad things start to happen relatively quickly there. And you see that she spikes a very high temp, has a blood pressure seems to be falling, which is, you know, people going, well, this sort of seems bad. But, you know, she is post-op. She had a spinal or an epidural or something like that. But the weird thing is now she's not right. Okay, this not being right is an important feature of sepsis, okay, where the mental status changes. And the, sort of the easy thing for you all is you normally have people who are right. Elsewhere in the hospital with the elderly, they may not be right to begin with, so it makes it a little more difficult. For the not being right is an absolute key sign. Saturation seemed to be dropping, and someone then says, well, we need to give her triples. Triples, okay? So she gets Amgent, and of course, what size does she get? She gets the 80. Why? It's the vial size, okay? So now this we've actually seen. I think Tom remembers a case not too long ago where there was a case where people decided to ramp up and gave the aminoglycoside but gave it a dose of 80 milligrams because that's the vial size. And gives a flagell also. What happens in the ICU? She comes downstairs to the ICU, has fluid, 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 plus more fluid, and I'll show you some data for the reason for that much fluid. She gets Zosin at this point because that's the drug of choice in the hospital overall, I'll tell you that for sure. She gets some vasopressors, she gets a central line, A line, vancomycin is added, she gets intubated, renal failure on dialysis, but the great thing about your patient population <laughs> is they get better. I mean, the most amazing thing is they almost all get better because they're young and healthy. She gets extubated diuresis and goes home not too much later. All right. Again, my disclaimer here, okay? This is a laundry list of what I think you guys see. Okay? What do you see? Well, the antipartum pyelonephritis is something you see. The bug is usually an enterococcus or E. coli that you're going to see for that. Septic abortion way beforehand, too. Rare, rare event now, but certainly something you can see. The one we already talked about, chorioamnionitis. Purpural sepsis, immediately after birth, according to my Wikipedia definition. <laughs> then, okay, <laughs> postpartum mutant infection. What are the risk factors? Now, this was something I read about, and you can tell me a lot more about it. It used to be C-sections. But with perioperative antibiotics, that's dropped to an exceedingly low number, which I thought was very interesting due to chorioamnionitis, amnionitis now. This is one I have not seen in our hospital anyway, but postpartum necrotizing fasciitis. Has anyone seen it? I'm sure. Is that right? Right. It's an awful, it's an awful disease process. We actually see it in, uh, you know, the older folks not too infrequently. We typically probably three or four times a year have a bad uh, necrotizing fasciitis in the ICU. 
All right, so that's just a laundry list. Another laundry list, and, and this I'm going to try to just simplify a little bit because I don't think you need to know a lot of this stuff. But you need to know the groups so that you can select your antibiotics. Okay, so if you look at what's in the female genital uh, tract and female genital infections is group A and B strep. Now you guys are all over group B strep, okay? And that has been a wonderful thing because the chance of neonatal meningitis and pneumonia has dropped to almost nothing with your incredible treatment of that. Neck fash, flesh eating, you know, group A strep, flesh eating. I think that's, a, that's a, a bad player. Enterococcus, you only see it in the urine and it's really something that's an early player for the typical pyelonephritis, okay? Staph aureus, typically in your population, it will be methicillin sensitive Staph aureus, but there are now more and more and more community acquired MRSA. So in the past, it used to be you could use oxacillin or Kefsol, but now it's turning out that Vanco and other kind of drugs for that for your MSS, M F MRSA are appropriate. Staph epidermidis, it's on everyone's skin right now. It's an unusual player to cause any kind of problems. If they happen to have hardware in or valve, it becomes a major player. But other than that, you know, so any foreign material it sticks to, it's unusual to be an invasive organism. Um, the gram negatives, I should have put them a little bit larger because in fact, they're major players that you see for any of your chorioamnionitis, obviously. So the gram negatives, those three of them there, are the most uh, significant and ones. And pylo too, right? And pylo, of course, yeah. E. coli, of course, is the one. E. coli and proteus are the two. You don't see Klebs typically in urine. Anaerobes. Anaerobes are all over the place. It's a large group. They're not usually a significant player. They don't usually grow out. But clearly, they need to be covered in any kind of infection that you will be dealing with, short of pylo. Okay, because pilo and anaerobic infection is unheard of. Other that we really don't see very much. Now this is where the issue of recognition of early sepsis really comes into play. Typically you guys will see a localized infection. All right, so what? You have no systemic symptoms whatsoever. You treat the localized infection either by getting rid of whatever the infection was, you know, d doing an operation, taking something out, or treating them with a lo an antibiotic. Okay? Just thinking about what the bugs are, giving them the right antibiotic. But what can happen? And this is the issue of early recognition. SIRS, which I'll talk about, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, so you'll hear this term all the time, and I'll define it about three or four more times because that is really the key issue here. Moving on to sepsis, and I'll give you the definition. Severe sepsis, septic shock, multiple organ dysfunction system, MODS, or multi-system organ failure. You'll hear, I think, usually you'll hear more, more, um, multi-system organ failure, more common than MODS, and then death occurs. All right, SIRS. Okay. What is SIRS? Now, let's look here for a second. Let's take one of your uh, laboring patients. If you look at laboring patients and try to stick them in this SIRS category, they almost all meet SIRS, which is a really difficult thing for you all because the typical thing on the adult medicine service that's not OB is this is what people are really locked into. So the floors are locked into identification of systemic inflammatory response syndrome. If we did that on the OB floor, 90% of people would fit into it from a heart rate and a respiratory rate standpoint. Okay? But it is something that's used throughout the hospital and throughout the country and the world to define sort of the prelude for sepsis. Okay? So it's an important uh, concept. What turns SIRS into sepsis? A source of infection. Because there are SIRS patients, I guess the obstetrical patient in labor is somewhat of an inflamed state or some unusual state, but also how about the pancreatitis patient? The pancreatitis patient is a patient who's not necessarily infected but has SIRS. Okay, so it's hard. They fall into a funny category. But what defines sepsis is the fact that you have an infectious source. You have chorioamnionitis plus you have a temp that's high and a heart rate that's fast. Okay, it's a little bit dicey on your floor because there are a lot of other things that cause the SIRS kind of response. What's the mortality? It's three to 10% mortality. So if you have sepsis alone, meaning infectious source plus SIRS, there is some mortality associated with it, okay? 
So it's an important thing right now to pick up there, and I'm going to show you this escalating mortality. Okay? So let's just remember this. So temp spikes, heart rate fast, respiratory rate being fast, and a white count. For the for some people who don't know what bandemias are, I think maybe some of the nursing staff may, may not know, it's immature forms of white cells. And so it's important, and even in the ICU, we have a little bit of an issue of having people focus on bandemia. So bandemia in the ICU patient, anyone with GI pathology, GYN pathology, pelvic pathology, that bandemia is absolutely critical to us. And we have this issue in the ICU where if in fact you have a bad belly, if something's going on with your belly, and you have 20, 30% bands, it's by definition a really bad thing going on. And it just raises everyone, even if they, in fact they look pretty good, it raises everyone's thought that, wow, this is significantly bad. So we pay attention to the bandemia quite a bit more than some other people do. And we've had certainly cases come up in the emergency room to the floor where the patient didn't look that sick, not an obstetrical patient, but the patient didn't look that sick and they had 30% bands. And I have to say, of all the ones that bounce into the ICU, every one of those, every one of those. So the bandemia is a really key player here. Now, what's severe sepsis? Now, severe sepsis is what we are trying to avoid. It's sepsis plus end organ damage sepsis plus end organ damage. So what is the end organ damage we're talking about? As I said, confusion. Confusion shows a low perfusion state. Okay, so confusion is an absolute key player in your kind of patient population. Obviously, hypoxemia, ARDS, acute lung injury. There are definitions about acute lung injury and ARDS, okay? What they are is acute lung injury is a specific defined uh, entity of a AA gradient of, oh, I'm sorry, a PF ratio, um, the partial pressure of oxygen to the FiO2 of 300 or less. So someone with a lot of oxygen having a low PO2. And then if you have ARDS, it's even lower than that. It's below 200. And you see diffuse infiltrates throughout the lungs without it being CHF. That's ARDS then. Cardiac, uh, cardiac poor LV function. And this is something we see all the time also, that you take a young buck or a young woman who's doing really well, get them septic, and you take an echo afterwards, and it looks like essentially an old man's heart. Okay, it's classic for severe sepsis. So cardiogenic shock is something you get all the time with severe sepsis. BP is low, vasodilatation. Now you'll see us use MAPS all the time. There's not a lot of use of systolic and diastolic pressure in the ICU. It's much more geared toward mean air, um, arterial pressure, indicative of forward flow and perfusion to the brain in the di uh, different organs. 65 or less. Now, the funny thing is up on OB, you have a lot of people who may be 65 or less to begin with. So you'll see the 80s to 90s, over 40s to 50s, especially post-op, or once you have that epidural in, it's like, okay, you're hanging at 85 or 95 as systolic pressure. So it's a little bit difficult to use blood pressure. But you know it when you see it. The guy who you've given a liter of fluid and they're persistently hypotensive, and it's no longer the anesthetic etiology. So that's an important one. Renal low urine output common. Now clearly your post-op patient have low urine output for multiple reasons. So it's a little bit confusion, confusing. And any evidence of a consumptive coagulopathy, that is now what's happening is low-grade DIC, which is a consumptive coagulopathy, the body's starting to clot off, and in the capillary system, the activation of the coagulation system causing lowering of the platelet count, that's a significant problem, and certainly end organ damage. Now you're up to 10 or 15 percent mortality. So if we get a patient to this level, this is even on your floor, and this is something you're trying to avoid getting to this level. But is this common? Sure. Because the sepsis patient, the SIRS plus infection, you see frequently. But what you're trying to really prevent is that organ dysfunction, escalation to that. And once you get there, you're really buying into a much higher morbidity, mortality. Severe sepsis. So blood pressure not responding to 20 or 30 cc's per kilo of fluid. Okay? That is septic shock. That is now, you've identified they have severe sepsis, and now what you're doing is giving them 20 to 30 cc's per kilo of fluid. And I'll show you a little later of why the fluids are really important. 30 to 50 percent mortality. Okay. This is just, again, the overall of what I've talked about, where you start with infection, you add SIRS to it, you end up with sepsis. You end up starting with infection, SIRS equals sepsis. And remember, this lower thing here is what you guys in the trenches are really looking for. 
Okay? This is the thing that you're trying to do to prevent so that they don't escalate onto septic shock, a severe septic, septic shock, and multi-system organ failure. Okay? This is the key. I mean, this is it. This is what it's all about is early uh, identification. I mean, almost nothing else is as important as this, okay? Once you recognize the problem, things are most of the time easily treatable. Okay, early recognition, early antibiotics, early removal of source infection, and that I have, that's up to you guys, okay? What is it that's infected? Is there something we can remove that's absolutely critical in the management of these patients? Early fluid management and early optimization of hemodynamics. Okay, early recognition. As I said, I think you guys have a really tough time, okay? They're sort of in a septicoid state to begin with. They have a lot of uh, indicators of sepsis already. Focus on, is there an untreated source of infection, okay? I think that the temperature for you guys, I mean, it's very straightforward. You have healthy patients. They mount temps. It's not a big mystery most of the time. And if you see temps of 102, 103, that's abnormal for you. I mean, I think that's relatively abnormal for you guys up there. So I think in terms of your SIRS criteria, I think that the easiest marker for you is temps. Do people disagree, agree, disagree, agree? The temp is a really very straightforward marker for you guys. You know, the white count for you, you'll have 15, 16,000 white counts without, without blinking an eye. And the other two, you know, you're not getting blood gases on people looking for PCO2s less than 32, and a respiratory rate of 24 is commonplace. So. I think the temperature marker for your SIRS is going to be the one that you're going to really be focused on, as you already are. Okay, again, I'm just trying to drive this home. These are the early warning signs. You know, it's the same thing I just said. Anyone who's hypotensive with low urine output in a temp, I mean, you're calling, you know, you're calling the troops in if, as far as I'm concerned at this point. Okay, this one is really, I have to say, for the nursing staff. And the reason I say for the nursing staff is that it's very easy for the doctors to write the order for the antibiotics, okay? And that's the easiest thing in the world. But when you start to look at how quickly those antibiotics get into the patient, especially an antibiotic like uh, imipenem. So it's not the thing that's hanging out on your floor most of the time, although maybe it is, I don't, I don't know, okay? Or, you know, or Zosin may be at this point on your floor, right? So. Those are drugs that you don't use very often, and what are you typically doing in a severe sepsis kind of patient or a sepsis? You're taking care of a million other things. So the doc goes into the place, into CPOE, writes the order, okay? She has done what she's supposed to be doing, writing the order nice and early for antibiotics, and then what are the nursing staff doing? They're trying to keep that patient sort of doing well, right? They may be in labor, they may be postpartum, so they're dealing with 10 other things. So the getting of that antibiotic from the pharmacy is always a major issue. But I have to say that in terms of prioritization, the giving of the antibiotics within one hour's time is an absolute, you know, crushing emergency. That needs to be done right away. And I'll show you a really interesting slide on this. Now this is a relatively new study from 2006, and this looked at a whole bunch of patients with septic shock. That is now they were hypotensive, clearly had a source of infection. Now, you know, you're not going to see a lot of OB patients like this. So they took patients who were 62, half were men, uh, all forms of sepsis, half were surgical, okay? Mortality, over 50%, okay? Over 50%. I, and I know this is a little bit confusing, but if you look on the left to begin with then, these are survival and who had a, uh, when the antibiotics were started, okay? Survival plotted against when antibiotics were started, okay? If you were at 30 minutes time, from the time that hypotension started, okay, so you were already down the line into septic shock, what did you see? So only 8% were started within a half hour. Only 8%, okay? But of those 8%, 82% had survival, survival, okay? So 82% survived. Nice, okay? Let's look at two hours. Now most of us would probably say, oh, two hours. You know, hey, that's a nice goal, right? Two hours time, right? Okay, you're now, only 25% had it started by then, 71% survival, an enormous drop in the survival rate. And at five hours time, which is hard to believe that people would wait actually five hours, okay? It turns out 50% survival. Now, what's crazy is you look all the way to the right, there are people who are persistently hypotensive 
who didn't receive antibiotics at all for many, many hours, eight, nine, ten hours in this study. So this stuff really does happen, and I can't tell you enough how important it is to get those antibiotics in early. Okay, obtain two sets of blood cultures and other cultures prior to antibiotics if possible, okay? Is it what's more important? Getting the cultures or getting the antibiotics? Getting the antibiotics, okay? So everyone knows that one, get the antibiotics. Do, do we really care that much exactly what the bug is? No, especially if you already know where the infection is coming from. Then you do the epidemiology of, you know, the bugs themselves are pretty much straightforward. It's either gram positive, gram negative, or anaerobes, and you're gonna treat them with these kind of antibiotics that kill them all. Get that antibiotic into them, get it into them early. If you can get two sets, do. How much blood do you need for, an, for a blood culture? Well, let me just say that you want as much blood as possible in those blood culture bottles. So one set of blood cultures are two bottles, okay? You want to get four bottles total, two sets. That's what you're trying to get. How much blood in the each bottle? Up to 10, okay, up to 10. You're really trying to get a lot. The more blood you get in there, okay, the better your sampling, okay? So if you throw a couple cc's in there, you're gonna have a negative culture. Okay, so it's almost not worth doing. I mean, it's worth doing because if it's a high-grade bacteremia, it's gonna work, but you really want volume. Okay, so if you can, from a nursing staff or from a phlebotomy, the phlebotomists do a great job of it. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. Please try to prep the area well because false positive ones get to be a major, major pain in the neck. How much staff, ep you always get staff epi out of the, out of the uh, cultures. Okay, so choice of antibiotics. This doesn't take an ID doc. I I'm telling you, it does not take an ID doc to figure this out at this point, although we're happy to have incredibly great ID docs here. What bugs? Okay, what bugs do they have? Now, what bugs come from, where do you think the source is? I mean, if you think the source is chorionitis, you know it's gonna be a gram-negative bug in there. That's what probably it's going to be. Answer, gram-positive, gram-negative, and anaerobes. That's all that's around, okay? Old school, Amgen, Flagyl, Amgen, Clinda, okay? What's the problem with Amgen, Flagyl, and Clinda? Dosing, dosing, okay? It's a hard thing, so what's the proper dose? The proper dose is really gonna be you know, one and a half milligrams per kilogram. So if you're still an aminoglycoside kind of doc, one and a half milligrams per kilogram. I'm not sure what's the proper dosing of a person who's just gained 50 pounds due to pregnancy too. Is it their dry, is it their pre-pregnancy weight, post-pregnancy weight? I mean, it's a little unclear what it is. So I think that the aminoglycosides, at least in the ICU, have slipped so far into the background that most of us have to pull out our, uh, pull out something, Hippocrates, to figure out what the dosing regimen is now. So aminoglycosides have really fallen into back, okay? Why? Dosing is difficult, renal insufficiency that's caused by it, okay? So I think that those are gone. I, now, the kill em all drugs are really a good group to know about, okay? The kill em all drugs get all your gram positives for the most part, all your gram negatives and all your anaerobes, okay? And we have three good ones in the hospital here. And the three good ones are Zosin, which again is probably the number one drug, in, I tell you, it's the number one drug in the ICU, it's sort of a joke. I mean, everyone gets put on bank Zosin as soon as they come into the ICU, okay? So Zosin is the one, gram positive, gram negative. Who can't you use this on? Penallergic patients, right? There's a beta-lactam moiety in it, you can't use it for them, okay? The carbipenems, the carbipenems are erdipenem and imipenem, okay? So imipenem is Promaxin, erdipenem is Envans, okay? The beautiful thing about imipenem, oh, I'm sorry, let me go to erdipenem. Erdipenem is once a day, no renal issues, no seizures, okay? What doesn't it get well? Pseudomonas, but pseudomonas is not your player. It's not who you guys treat, okay? So invent, once a day drug, goes in, no issues whatsoever. Is there a tiny, tiny, tiny cross reactivity with penicillins? Sure. But unless some person had anaphylactic and death and CPR needed for it, you're gonna give Invans as a drug. Can you give Imi as well? Yeah, Imi is the other great drug. It's a better, stronger, broader drug than erdipenem. But there's one little catch in the thing is that seizures. So in your patient population who may have some predisposition with PIH or something like that, so you have a subgroup of patients who may have a risk for seizure, Imipenem, the only reason to avoid it is the seizure threshold gets changed. Okay, so, so I think that you guys can use any of those three drugs and timing is everything there. First line treatment, okay, is fluids, are fluids. 
okay? Fluids, 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 plus more fluids. It's called distributive shock. Septic shock is one of the forms of distributive shock, okay? It's essentially vasodilatation of the arteries and veins. Hey, it's actually similar to when the epidural or the spinal goes in. It's a very similar physiology. How do we treat that? Fill the tank. Keep filling the tank. If you don't fill the tank, you don't have positive, you don't fill, you don't, Remember the Starling curve that you have to fill them up to get good stroke volume. So you want to fill the tank so the heart gets full so there's great forward flow. That's what we're trying to do by filling the tank. Same concept is true in septic shock. Third spacing, that's what's happening now with, the, uh, with septic shock. 20 to 30 cc's per kilo of LR or normal saline. There's no real difference between LR and normal saline. Um, either one would be absolutely fine. Normal saline is a classic drug of choice. It's a little saltier than LR is, so you get a little more bang for your buck, but LR is absolutely appropriate, too. What do they do when they come to the unit? CVP. Some people have central lines put in. Is it absolute? Well, I'm sort of an anti-CVP guy, but that's just me. But you'll see a lot of people who, by definition, if you come into septic shock now, the cookbook says you get a CVP placed. And again, there's no difference between colloids and crystalloids from when the docs and the nurses were all in school. There was that debate that raged on, and it's still raging on. Who knows the difference between the two? But how about this one? If you have a patient who has really terrible IV access and is hypotensive, and you're squeezing the bag in, and it's dripping almost like a micro drip kind of thing, more bang for your buck with colloids. So if you have head of starch, HESPAN, or you have albumin, more bang for your buck in terms of volume expansion. So if you have a limitation in IV access, that's the only time I would say would be a good one for colloids. Okay, because you get more bang for your buck. So second for second, you get a lot of bang there. 20 to 30 cc's per kilogram is what? That's like 600 cc's? Two to three liters. Yeah, it's almost always two to three liters. Okay? Over how long? As fast as you can get it in. So if they're hypotensive, they have a pressure of 60 over 40 kind of thing, you're just essentially opening up two lines and pouring it in as fast as it goes in. So it, it really has to whale in there, you know, pretty quickly. Okay, so, you know, when we have to write the order, we'll say, you know, a liter over a half hour. But in, in reality, you're sitting there and the, pour, and the fluid's just pouring in. <laughs> Yeah. But you don't want to give the, at least my thought is, I don't want to give them too much uh, uh, crystalloid. crystalloid because they'll start getting into failure. Yeah. So three liters sounds like that. I know it's crazy, isn't it? I'll show you why. Why, yeah. why it's an important thing then, too. Because outcomes are incredibly different when people have started being much more aggressive with fluids. Uh, but, that, but remember, we're talking about a subset of patients now who you've already defined as septic <coughs> shock. Okay, you've already defined them as severe sepsis. Okay, they have end organ, they have sepsis plus an end organ damage, and now they're now hypotensive, and you're trying to get them back. Okay, so I'm not talking about a typical patient on the fifth floor who's now post-op has a little bit of a temp, and you're thinking maybe we're just behind in fluids. Yeah, a little different story. Now this is one that, if you want to talk. Uh, ICU jargon, okay, and you want to be thought of as a happening kind of person in terms of sepsis, okay, even though it's now not as happening as it used to be in 2001, okay, is say the name Manny Rivers, okay, if you say the name Manny Rivers, that's the doc who came up with now what's called the Rivers Protocol, and people actually say that you're going to be admitted to the ICU and riverize them, okay, so river, river, okay, so Manny Rivers is an emergency room doc out of Henry Ford. And what he started to realize is maybe what was happening is the problem we're having with septic shock is we were getting to them too late. That is, they'd sit in the emergency room and they'd sit on the floor and they'd sit there for four or five hours. And then we'd get into the ICU and you know all hell would break loose and people would be attacking these people and they'd still die. And what he basically said is, we're going to take these patients into a monster <coughs> hospital like Henry Ford, where they were sitting in the emergency room. He's an ER doc. And we're going to basically enter them into a protocol that pushes, uh, uh, pushes them, puts them in this recipe. Okay, I have this slide of he's, a, he's on the picture of uh, uh, you know, Bon Appetit or something like that, because it's, he's, it's such a cookbook that we do now that it's, uh, it's actually turned into a fairly straightforward thing. So what he did is he took 263 patients in shock. And what he did is put them into two categories. One, 
is our traditional CVP map, amino, array, amino arterial pressure and pressors. And the other one, he said, I'm going to do the typical stuff that we do. But now we're going to look at something called mixed venous. Now what is a mixed venous? A mixed venous is if you put a CVP in someone and you look at the, arterial, the blood coming back to the heart and you take the saturation, the amount of oxygen in, that's a good representation of good oxygen delivery. The lower the blood returning to the heart, the lower the oxygen level returning to the heart, you know, the worse the oxygenation is at the tissue level. The higher, the better. It means the heart's going really well, pumping forward, going through the system, and coming back nice and high. That's what we want. We want oxygen delivered to the tissue to prevent badness from occurring. All right. This is just the protocol. He basically said he sets them up, he puts a CVP in, he gives them crystalloid or colloid, and here he basically goes, I'm going to give them enough to get their CVP up to 12. That means they're tanked. When people look at neck veins, they can actually look at CVP instead. We're going to tank them, make sure the tank is full. Then we're going to give them some pressors to make sure the mean arterial pressure is 65. And if that doesn't work to get their mixed venous up, the oxygen returning to the blood up, then we're going give, to give them blood because we know that blood carries oxygen. And if that doesn't work, we're going to whip their heart. And we're going to give them something to increase contractility. And we're going to keep trying to whip the heart to try to get oxygen delivered to the tissue. And what did he show? I'm just going to take the little boxed one. What he showed with his protocol, which was fairly amazing, is that you went from a 50% mortality at 28 days, and you dropped it to 33% with early goal-directed therapy. So Manny Rivers proved back in 2001 that the early administration of fluids, the early administration of blood, the early administration of pressors and, and inotropes, and the key is early, that people got tremendously better. So this is now the absolute standard of care within ICUs, okay, is riverization or Man Manny Rivers protocol. Just a word on this, too. I know that this is not about ICU management of it, but just these, these are things that you hear about all the time. The drugs that we use, okay, we, you see us use neosinephrine on my anesthesia side. You'll see neo all the time. It just is a squeezing agent. It doesn't do anything for the heart okay, whatsoever. So you don't see a lot of neo anymore in the ICU for low-grade sepsis because what does it do? It sort of prevents the heart from working well sometimes because essentially you're, you're asking it to work uphill now. So you're not going to see a lot of neo anymore. You'll see drugs that are mixed agonists, so both beta agonists for the heart and alpha agonists for the periphery to get some squeeze out of it. So you'll see a lot more norepinephrine. And any of the docs about my age, it used to be levofed is what we use. And what did it used to be called the name one now? What, what, when I was a resident, it, you never used levofed. And Le leave them dead, right. So leave them dead is what we used to use. We never used back, you know, 20 years ago because it was always a last ditch effort. Now, you know, half the ICUs on levofed right now. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing how much levofed we use. It's mainly alpha, but it's also a squeezing agent for the heart to make it work better. Vasopressin. Vasopressin is a drug that's used in the ICU, okay? And it's an arterial vasoconstrictor. Turns out that actually in septic shock, what happens? your brain depletes all the vasopressin it has right away. That is, it sees it's a problem, it, it sees there's a problem, it dumps all the vasopressin from the brain that it has, and now you become depleted. So it's been clearly shown that vasopressin depletion occurs in septic shock, so we give it back now exogenously. All right. Getting help in Newton Wellesley Hospital, okay? So there is something called the rapid response protocol. And what it is, is that any time you meet certain physiologic parameters, or the nurse is concerned about the situation that's going on in the room, they can activate the rapid response team. And the rapid response team, remember, it's not a specific team that's sort of sitting in a back room someplace that's going to, there's a SWAT team that's going to come in. So it's, it's, we're changing the name from rapid response team to rapid response protocol, something like that, right? right. Because uh, <laughs> that SWAT team thing, all of a sudden people have the misconception of who's going to show up right away. So typically here, if they meet the triggers, then they'll call the obstetrician who's either on that day, or I'm sorry, the primary obstetrician, is that correct? The primary obstetrician, or the covering obstetrician, or the, move, the overnight, the person in-house. The person in -house. Yeah. They'll come. They have options then. That obstetrician then can actually call the intensivist. There's a 24-hour ICU service here now, okay? There are two people, names to know, intensivists, as well as locum tenens, okay? Locum tenens are just guys like me who come after I leave, okay? So they, 
men, the ICU, the more senior people, are they all attending level? No, most of them are fellows. Okay, most of them are fellows, but they are incredibly good. Incredibly good, I think. Um, the hospital service, wonderful service, unbelievable. They're here now 24-7. They seem to have a lot of them, and they get expanding every day, and they're just great people. Uh, so those are important things to know about. All right. Do you have any questions? Is that clear to everyone? I mean, to put it in a nutshell, it's basically recognition, recognition, recognition. Okay, that's what it really is all about. The only thing I would add is the one person you left off that we always call is the anesthesiologist. Because they're very helpful. Oh, that's true. I didn't put them on there. I didn't put that on my list. They, they get called, they'd say, virtually always. Good. Good. I think that we in the anesthesia department appreciate those calls. I think that we have no trouble uh, responding to those whatsoever. Sure. You know, there's kind of a lot of stuff going on. I think we really over-treat because of this... Fear of sepsis kind of thing? Yeah. It's yeah, certainly. And it's a lot of antibiotics that go out there. If there's any other way besides over-treating, so I mean, what's the likelihood that any of our women are going to get septic shock? So what's the incidence, first of all, in this healthy population of pregnant women? And it's very, I mean, it's very hard, you know, in order, when I look through this and try to look at the numbers, you have to go to sort of high-risk populations in big cities to try to come up with numbers with poor prenatal care and a lot of multi, and a lot of other risk factors. At Newton Wellesley Hospital, you have a very healthy patient population. So the numbers are so low that it's very difficult for you all because it's not like you're expecting it very often. So I had a hard time coming up with numbers uh, in a healthy population. Maybe Tom knows more than I do about it or any of the guys. I don't know. How frequent I, it is? No, it's 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 not frequent at all, which makes it a challenge because it's one of those yeah. low incident events. But when it happens, it's extremely serious, and the patients get very very sick. So our challenge is you know, how do we recognize it without potentially overtreating? <coughs> yeah, I suppose it maybe you know every five years we have one who's sick or something like that. More I mean, often than that. Okay. So it's a, it's a very tough one, and I think what you have to do then if you want to try to prevent overtreating is think about looking for other signs of it. I mean, if it's not just temp, you have pulse, respiratory rate, white count, pandemia, those are things I look for. I, I, first thing I'll say is I think it's a tough one for you guys. Yeah, as long as you think that you're treating the underlying cause. I mean, if there's a, I think your challenge is always seeing whether or not you as a clinician then figure out if this is the normal or is there something that's making you think things are not clear. If the urine output is changing, the mental status is changing, it's, it's a gestalt. I mean, you guys are dealing with an inflamed state to begin with, so it's difficult. Then you have, and, and a lot of us will, if, if it's easy, give the antibiotics right away. Right. But if they don't have an obvious source of sepsis, then I think it's more difficult. And I think then doing what you suggested is really reasonable. Um, some of, so like in labor, um, it's going to be even rarer because you're not going to have a source of sepsis. But it's those patients that come in with pilo or who had a UTI and now have back pain. And the two really bad ones are my group A, the strep, and, and pilo. I mean, anything, it seems like, from renal disease can lead to sepsis. But you have a source of sepsis then? Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah, I'm looking, you always look for risk factors, but then you just sort of see on the board, oh, choreo, 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 choreo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's for you guys. I mean, I can't, I can't answer that. That's for you guys to figure out. Separate from yeah, who has choreo, who doesn't have choreo. That would be certainly out of what I would, uh, that's why those are the one things I say, okay, you guys have to figure out if they had the source of sepsis, and then I know what to treat. But 103 is different from 10 of 101. Right. I agree. I agree. It's hard to ignore a temp of 103.
unusual, <coughs> over and above what we normally see. And I think sometimes people say, oh, you know, that abdominal pain, you get after pains because of, uh, you know, the uterus and the yeah. pain. Um, I had a, a patient here that was here for a week, and her fever came down. They sent her home because she was eight grade raw for 24 hours <coughs> just to have it spike when she got home because she had an abscess growing in her belly, and she'd been complaining about abdominal pain the whole way through. So I think that it's just important, right. you know, for people to look at the whole picture. Right. It's very easy to be lulled to sleep. I mean, I think as Tom pointed out, <laughs> the problem that we have in all these rare events is that you get really used to them being healthy, nice people who are going to go home on day two or day five. That's what's going to happen. And you, you have to really be vigilant to looking for those alternative signs such as, you know, when do you get the, when do you get the white count again? When do you look for the bandemia and a normal health? Do you really want to stick them again on day four, you know, to get a white count that's going to be negative? And so, uh, you know, I don't envy the task that you guys have where 99.9% .9 of your people are very healthy. Um, it's very hard. Other questions? Okay, let's answer these in general then as a group. Who's the one who has severe sepsis here? Four. That's an easy one, okay? The other ones are things that you see but not necessarily severe sepsis. All but one of the following. Three. Three, right. I didn't even answer this to you guys, did I? Two is the right answer. You want two sets, not one. Why two sets? Because one may be contaminated, okay? So if you get a staff... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, two sets, three. Three, yeah. So, sorry, at the same time. There were people who used to think that you could separate by an hour, but in this situation, you're going to have rip-roaring, ugly bacteremia. You get it right away. You get different sites. Different sites, right. Because you're trying to prevent the contamination issue from one site, and then so you want a second site to sort of offset a potential mistake on the first one. Okay? That's an easy one. What's the medical assistance protocol? Follow the office building. You go down in the office building. Hi. If you go down the office building, or what about if your uh, the father falls and hits his head? Yeah. You know what I mean. What it is is a a process in the hospital to take non patients, visitors, or outpatient someone coming in for a lab draw, you know, or someone in the medical office building or in the new oncology center. They're just hanging out there, mind their own business, and they have a medical issue. Okay. They're not admitted, they don't have a wristband, they don't have anything on. How do we care for those patients? Now, obviously, if they have a code, if they fall, a uh, dad falls and their head breaks open and they're having a code, that's a different story. They need a code call, it makes no difference. But if it's short of that and they need a trip to the emergency room, then you call medical assistance protocol. And who do you get? You get the emergency room nurse, you get an intensivist, you get security, and you get transport. And you get a couple other nursing hierarchy. Okay, when is the optimal time for antibiotics when sepsis is suspected? Sooner the better. What are you, what are you not going to give? Right. Thanks very much. Can I answer anything? Thank you, guys. Questions?